It's time for Global Insight. Chuseok has Korea's largest autumn holiday throughout the generations has served as a time for a checkup on inter-Korean relations. And during the years of the relatively warmer ties between Seoul and Pyongyang, the two governments coordinated reunions of family members separated by the border since the 1950-53 Korean War. However, such gestures won't be made during this year's holiday as relations have deteriorated since 2018 following a flurry of engagement between Seoul, Washington and Pyongyang that ultimately failed. North Korea has also recently rejected the Yoon Seok-yeol government's offer of economic aid in return for steps towards denuclearization. And today we take a look at where inter-Korean ties stand at this time for the divided nation. And for this, we have in studio Chad Do Carroll, Chief Executive Officer of Korea Risk Group, who founded NK News and NK Pro as major sources of North Korea-related news and analysis. We also connect with Dr. Stephen Noerpa, President of Asia Dialogue and adjunct research scholar of Columbia University. University joining us online from Honolulu. Uh, very warm, uh, warm welcome to you both. Uh, it's great to see you in studio, Chad. Well, first of all, North Korea, it was set to have a uh, parliamentary meeting on Wednesday, I believe, and where they discuss uh, key domestic agendas. And what do you think the key priorities for the regime are right now? Well, Wednesday's meeting, the meeting that was earlier this week was mainly about disaster preparedness, uh, waiting for this typhoon, which uh, luckily for the North Koreans seemed to swerve uh, most of the country. But I think right now the, the, tea, the key priorities for Pyongyang are basically economic and military. On the economic front, we've seen uh, Kim Jong-un declare victory against COVID. And so I think what we're going to see in the weeks ahead, maybe the months ahead, is more effort to get trade restarted between China and, and other neighboring countries. Um, and we may even see people start to cross the border. We've heard from sources that uh, there may be, uh, North Korea may be readying to allow people in and out of the country for the first time uh, since the virus. On the military front, um, we have this five-year military plan that Kim Jong-un revealed at the Eighth Party Congress in January 2021. Uh, when the Chinese Party Congress is done, I think, therefore, we may see North Korea resume testing again. It may be uh, pausing to allow the Chinese Congress to go, away, go along without much disturbance. Uh, but we could see satellite launches towards the end of the year, early next year. Uh, that was one of their, their big plans. Maybe missile tests and, of course, this seventh nuclear test, which still hasn't happened. Right, of course. But um, staying on the topic of the typhoon day, uh, disaster preparedness, rather. Well, the South saw substantial damages from the recent typhoon. And of course, this isn't the uh, first heavy rainfall to hit the peninsula. We had one about two months ago. And well, how has the heavy rainfall and flooding really affected North Korea? Well, this year we've seen um, North Korean, presumed North Korean bodies showing up in the Han River estuary. Uh, I think there were three cases. We haven't seen this for, for quite a few years, so it looks like there was flooding that must have washed, unfortunately, people away and they sadly drowned. So that's one tragic outcome. Uh, we've also seen North Korea opening its floodgates. Uh, they do this next to the Imjim uh, Reservoir and they don't, unfortunately, announce this in advance. And in the past, this has led to like flash flooding on the, North, on the South Korean side, in some cases killing South Korean citizens. Um, luckily, none died this year, but that was one of their uh, responses to this heavy rain. Um, also, the, the, the seventh nuclear test we've all been expecting, um, a lot of analysts uh, speculated that the reason that didn't happen was because of the heavy rain. When there's heavy rain in North Korea, it's very difficult for senior officials to efficiently travel throughout the country. And of course, Pungeri, the nuclear test site, that's up in the northeast, very far away. So railroads, uh, regular roads would have been probably inundated and made it difficult for Kim Jong-un to get up there. And lastly, the Sohe uh, Satellite Center, where North Korea launches its rockets from, we, we know from satellite imagery that there was flooding there along some of the railroads that connect to it, which may have disturbed some of the renovation work, which is, again, part of this five-year military plan that Kim Jong-un has. Right. So it looks like the North has been affected by uh, the weather-related uh, disasters here on the peninsula. But, well, we've had news of other sort of humanitarian concerns as well, uh, bringing you into the conversation, Stephen. Now, despite a severe outbreak of COVID-19 and, of course, the reported food shortages, as well as the heavy rainfall in North Korea, uh, the regime there, it's continued to reject offers of humanitarian assistance from South Korea and the United States. Well, why do you think they're doing so, aren't they just basically shooting themselves in the foot? 
Well, there are a couple of uh, things we should assume uh, may be happening. Uh, one is that North Korea uh, is telling a narrative that they have dealt with it, right? They really announced that this has uh, come full bore and that they have remedied it. And that's part of the mythology around Kim Jong-un's uh, leadership and to show uh, an effectiveness uh, from their perspective. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's uh, a dangerous gamble, and the WHO and others feel that uh, COVID is probably still a real issue. Uh, secondly, they may be receiving assistance, certainly through China, uh, and we know that there has been a good deal of transfer of uh, medical supplies in that regard, uh, possibly some potential for Russia in time. Uh, and thirdly, the North Koreans seem to have figured out a way to produce some sort of vaccine, um, and so... It, there may be some efficacy to that, but it's not a broad-based health plan, and we know that the health system is in a serious need uh, of uptick. That's an opportunity for South Korea in time, given its excellence in the medical front, and perhaps over time we should be talking about things like a common Korean uh, health approach. And uh, Chad, your platform NK Pro, its timeline tracks major events that happened on the Korean Peninsula. And recently you highlighted uh, the Uti Freedom Shield uh, joint military exercises between South Korea and the US, as well as the audacious, uh, audacious initiative that President Yoon um, gave more elaborate details on recently. So would you say that inter-Korean relations over the past month have uh, improved or taken a turn for the worse? Well, anytime there are US, uh, South Korea drills, uh, tensions, uh, increase somewhat, at least if you look at North Korean state media, what they're saying and some of the responses in South Korea. We've seen Kim Yo Jong issue a fiery statement and lots of North Korean uh, state media articles about how this is preparations for war, etc. But it's not actually been too bad. Uh, if you look back at 2013 when Pat Gun Hay was uh, president and also 2015, these were times when inter Korean tensions really erupted. And what we're seeing now is pretty minor in comparison. Um, I do think, though, we should be prepared for uh, tensions to rise if and when North Korea goes ahead with these uh, tests that I was talking about earlier. I see. And uh, well, now, uh, Stephen, the Yoon government's audacious plan, of course, for North Korea, as uh, Chad just said, it's been shot down by uh, Kim Jong-un's younger sister, Kim Yo-jong. And well, as for the Biden administration, many are wondering whether strategic patience has made a return. So what are your thoughts on this? And what do you think should be sold in Washington's strategy to engage the North? Sure. Well, well, one is it's premised on where North Korea is at. And I'm not certain that North Korea uh, has completely shot down the idea. I believe they've taken some time here. Uh, as Chad has mentioned, there has not been an imperative, especially given uh, the COVID situation, which essentially shut Korea, North Korea off for two years, uh, certainly in terms of the uh, recent climatic uh, conditions. So, uh, it seems that uh, the jury may still be a bit out and that it, we should allow time for North Korea to process the audacious initiative. Uh, it behooves the United States and Korea, to your question, to uh, more aggressively put out very pragmatic aspects to the North Koreans, uh, given their economic need, uh, given their health concerns uh, and concerns on other fronts. Uh, they may be willing to deal uh, based on the fact that uh, they have essential uh, necessity and that they need support over time to get the kind of economic opening that would allow North Koreans to enjoy a more beneficial lifestyle. And Kim Jong-un is accountable in particular to all those younger North Koreans, as well as a burgeoning middle class, as reported, uh, as well as the long-term vested interests. So I would think uh, that it, it takes some creative impulse in both Washington and Seoul to not only say willing to meet at any time, and that's an admirable statement, but to really put together an initiative that is grounded with some pragmatic trade-offs for North Korea so that they can see on a register that progress on denuclearization or other security concerns or human rights fronts will see developmental benefits and will see uh, economic benefits that uh, really will, will lead to the success uh, or at least the stability uh, of the regime over time. And Chad, well, what are your thoughts on the Union administration's audacious initiative? Why do you think the North has basically flat out rejected the plan? Well, if you were Kim Jong-un and you had nuclear weapons and they're essential to your security, why would you start trading them away to a president who's not going to be here in five years? Um, 
The other thing is the economic development that he's suggesting, I think a lot of observers don't really understand that this isn't actually very attractive to North Korea. Trump made the same mistake, Park Geun Hye, uh, former South Korean president, made the same mistake. They think that presenting this vision of a, a strong economy uh, integrated into the, the global financial system is something attractive to North, but it's not because that requires greater transparency within the North Korean system. It requires information inflows to increase. These are two things that are highly uh, d uh, you know, looked down upon by the North Korean government because they complicate the state ideology and control system. The other thing is, let's say an audacious plan works. You start to get North Korean uh, companies and entrepreneurs uh, developing in and becoming rich. And these people can actually become a threat politically to North Korea, to Kim Jong-un's uh, grip on power in the, in the long term. We've seen in China recently Xi Jinping clamping down on some of the biggest names and entrepreneurs. It's the same thing in, in, in North Korea. Um, lastly, again, why would, why would Kim Jong-un want to trade steps towards denuclearization for this economic uh, vision when it comes with so much ideological risk for his control? And what's been uh, worrying some cons uh, observers is North Korea inching closer and closer to the likes of China and Russia. And my next question to you, Stephen, as well. As North Korea seems to be uh, cozying up to Moscow, uh, on Tuesday, the US Department of Defense it said that Russia has been looking to purchase North Korean uh, rockets and even artillery shells. And well, where do Pyongyang Moscow ties stand right now? And would their increasing partnership then thwart efforts to restore talks on denuclearization? Well, this is a worrying development, and clearly North Korea has worked with and, and to some extent uh, optioned off Moscow and Beijing over many years, I mean, really through the entirety of its existence. However, the face is new now based on the fact that Russia has mounted this horrible invasion on Ukraine. And there are not many nations that have stood with it. And the initial United Nations General Assembly vote uh, condemning Russian action uh, all but four countries uh, uh, joined in or abstained. And of the four who supported Russia, uh, one was the DPRK. Uh, also, the DPRK has recognized the Donetsk Republic. So that has made Russia happy. Uh, however, in the uh, longer term perspective, uh, Russia nor China, for that matter, uh, would be happy with the DPRK seventh test, which pushes it over a threshold. Uh, we are in the larger security dynamics seeing uh, North Korea uh, China and Russia grow closer together. And that's of worrying concern, especially because it reinforces a certain bloc mentality. And North Korea may be reading this as an opportunity to hide behind Beijing and behind Moscow on certain points. So these reports of weaponry are very concerning. It, really what it does point to, though, as the New York Times and others have suggested, is attrition in Russia. That should be the lesson North Korea walks away with, that the Russians have gone further than they were capable of. And it reflects the fact that the DPRK is providing equipment to a Russia that has serious, serious deficits. And so uh, while that may have economic short-term benefits for North Korea, it says in my case that uh, Russia uh, is not uh, uh, a, a source to be marveled at or to be uh, upheld in that regard, but really it shows the weakness of Putin's approach. And Chad, well, for months and months, uh, South Korea and the United States, they've said that uh, their door, door is open for talks with North Korea and that um, they can have talks anytime, anywhere. But clearly, North Korea hasn't taken up their offer. But, uh, then how do you think Seoul and Washington should really change their approach to effectively engage the regime in talks? Uh, sadly, I think it's too late now. Uh, we've had two years of this uh, talks anytime, uh, frankly, nonsense, which doesn't really mean anything to the North Koreans. Uh, Biden, he's a leader that called Kim Jong-un a thug in the campaign trail. Um, he has not made any effort that we know of to personally reach out leader to leader uh, in the way that Trump did. There have been several missed opportunities that, you know, very soft outreach in the style that Trump was doing, a birthday greeting or something. Um, I mean, even the British Queen has, has uh, sent letters uh, or, or paid uh, homage to uh, North Korea on, on, on political anniversaries recently. Um, so it's not that controversial, and we have the precedent of, uh, of Trump having done the same. But I sadly, I think really two years in, um, the, 
the North Koreans are not going to be interested in talking to Biden. And don't forget, Trump may also be coming back in 2024. So that would be the ideal situation for Kim Jong-un. I see. And Stephen, well, usually around this time of year, we talk about reuniting separated families on either side of the border. But uh, people to people exchanges, they do depend very heavily on the political situation. And what does the current level of tension on the peninsula mean for separated families? And what kind of efforts do you think should be uh, made to build peaceful cooperation with the North, if possible? Well, for many of the reasons that Chad has just adroitly pointed to, uh, the political environment is not good. Uh, for the two Koreas, and North Korea knows that uh, there is leverage in providing cooperation on family reunions. That's tragic, and that's very hard for the Korean peoples in the South, and I would dare say the North as well, uh, because it does represent something hugely symbolic about the potential for integration, for uh, reunification, and eventual reconciliation. Uh, that's what we can dream of and aspire toward. What it will take in the meantime, though, is adapting new attitudes. Really, those attitudes need to look at the developmental concerns of the DPRK, opportunities for the ROK uh, to integrate and ultimately lessen the costs of that integration and unification by providing support now uh, when the DPRK responds in a way that makes it amenable to support for energy, agriculture, education, health, uh, as I've mentioned, an area where South Korea really excels. Uh, they're interested in space, they're interested in weather, those are other areas uh, that the DPRK may lean forward on. Uh, so they, again, may be judging a little bit more of this audacious initiative than we've given credit for, and we'll have to wait and see. But it does take some creativity, and ultimately, it takes positive DPRK response, no, how, no matter how ably uh, Washington or Seoul uh, put the agenda forward. But they must try and they must be creative in their vision. Well, that was Chad O'Carroll, Chief Executive Officer of Korea Risk Group, and Dr. Stephen Noerpa, President of Asia Dialogue and Adjunct Research Scholar of Columbia University. Thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.